So, Norman, I've heard that you have recently launched a career in comedy. Oh, uh, well, yes, I have, kind of, yeah. It's better fun than being a journalist, I have to say. <laughs> I, be- Loose, I believe you that. A much looser hold on reality. <laughs> Loose is the word for it. What exactly were you comedically, uh, comedically, I don't even know what the word is yet. Well, I have to give credit to our colleague, our our, our uh, podcast colleague, Angela Lavoie-Pierre, who does Schmeitgeist. I highly recommend Schmeitgeist for your podcasting. And uh, but who is a stand-up comedian as well. So she organised this debate with the non-controversial title, Monogamy, the Natural Way to Love. Okay. Which side were you on? Uh, well, you, you know, toss of a coin here, but <laughs> I was on the opposition and we won. <laughs> what did your partner think about that? Um, well, she was in the audience and... Uh, she was taking furious notes. Yeah, and we still have a relationship. Well, that's good. Uh, I won't ask if it's an open or closed one because it is time for Coronacast, a show all about the coronavirus, sometimes other nasties as well. I'm health reporter Tegan Taylor coming to you from Jagera and Turable Land. And I'm physician and journalist Dr Norman Swan coming to you from Gadigal Land. And Norman, it's time to get into COVID news, the news that's been making news in COVID this week. And one of the big things is about predicting the next strain of coronavirus. It's going to be a problem for us. Flu experts have been doing this for years with our flu vaccine. We're now getting into this rhythm with COVID vaccines. What are the experts saying about what we need to be vaccinating for with COVID? They don't know really because we haven't got into the rhythm yet with COVID that we've got with flu, which is a seasonal virus. And we know that it's going to come around each winter. And you can predict with flu, for example, what's going around in the Northern Hemisphere, what's going around in equatorial areas and what's going on in the Southern Hemisphere. And they bring all that together to design the vaccine for the next season, whether it be the Northern Hemisphere season or the Southern Hemisphere season. Coronavirus is not like that yet, so we've still got subvariants appearing. But the World Health Organization met to discuss just this issue. And effectively, there are very few infections left in the world from the ancestral virus that uh, appeared in Wuhan. And uh, the dominant virus, subvariants of the virus that are appearing around the world are still in the Omicron family, but they're the subvariants beginning with XBB. We were calling them Arcturus. Well, we weren't. <laughs> Experts were calling them Arcturus as their nickname. Yeah, and really they're, they're quite immune evasive. So they're immune evasive of the previous vaccines and previous immunity to other subvariants and variants of the, uh, of the coronavirus. So that's what's dominating at the moment. One of the things we've talked about a bit is bivalent or multivalent vaccines where there's more than one type of coronavirus in the vaccine, the way we have with flu, where you have maybe four different strains of flu in there to sort of safeguard you. What's the latest thinking on multivalent vaccines? Essentially, the World Health Organization has recommended that we abandon multivalent vaccines at the moment for for the coronavirus, for the COVID-19 vaccine, given that there's very little of the previous viruses around. It's the new subvariants that are around. And they're suggesting moving to a monovalent vaccine for next round, which would be XBB and one of the subvariants of XBB, perhaps the latest one of those. And therefore, to get maximum effect and, um, and really focus in on these highly evasive subvariants. But if I go to my pharmacy today and say I need, I'm up to date, I need to be up to date with my COVID vaccine, what am I actually going to be getting in my arm? In Australia, you're going to be getting the bivalent vaccine, uh, which is the BA strain along with the ancestral strain. Now, that provides you with pretty good coverage against severe disease, not so good coverage against transmission, um, very little coverage, in fact, against transmission, um, and some coverage against symptomatic disease. So there, it's not bad. Um, it's not that much better than the original vaccine, the, the monovalent to the ancestral virus. Um, However, it is a bit better, but it's not as good as it could be if you had the specific XBB vaccine um, for the current variants that are going around. When am I going to get one of those? Well, that's uh, up to the manufacturers and regulators and countries about what they're wanting to buy. But assumingly, uh, I assume that what we're going to get into is a rhythm of the vaccine manufacturers producing the vaccines that WHO recommends um, uh, for countries to purchase. Similar to what we have with flu. Yes. So I don't think any are available at the moment, but um, watch this space. So I'm going to say a word to you that we talked about a lot early in the pandemic, and I want to just jog your memory with it. As long as it's not monogamy, I'm fine. (laughs) 
the word is super spreader. Oh, right. Do you remember okay. this one? Yeah, it's just sort of the polyamorous side of um, the COVID-19. I think you're probably at higher risk if you're polyamorous. I don't know. Uh, don't, quote, don't quote me on that. Uh, have, have you met any super spreaders recently? Well, not to my knowledge, because I haven't uncovered for... <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Steer clear. <laughs> Steer clear. The, uh, yeah, well, this is this, you know, go back to the beginning of the pandemic. We knew that there were probably people that uh, were super spreaders going on pr other kinds of infection, and indeed there are. But one of the questions we had was whether they were like biologically super spreaders, whether they just made more virus or whether they were just really popular and had a lot of friends and the social reasons for, for spreading to a lot of people. Well, now we have some answers on that. Thanks to um, a very generous group of volunteers in London at the Royal Free Hospital who agreed to be um, inoculated with COVID-19. For the layperson, that just means they squirted coronavirus up their nose. They did. And the it was a pre-alpha coronavirus. So it was pretty much like the ancestral virus. And these were in unvaccinated uh, people between the age of 18 and 30. And uh, not just unvaccinated, they hadn't had COVID. So they were COVID virgins, if you like, to use the monogamous, uh, let's keep the monogamous, polyamorous <laughs> keep riding this metaphor, <laughs> keep going here. And uh, they were doing it initially to um, to look at the effect of the of, of the infection itself. But in this study, and it was part of the same study, they looked at, at spread. And so they did nose swabs, they did throat swabs, they did surface swabs, they did mask swabs, uh, they did air sampling um, over a period of 14 days to look at what happened to these people. So they were inoculated with a pretty reasonable dose of the virus. Having been inoculated with the virus, only about half of them actually got infected. So that was interesting to start with. So you're giving people COVID on purpose and they don't necessarily actually even get it, even though they were unvaccinated. Correct. So the um, why that's the case is uh, a matter of conjecture, um, whether their antibodies were in good shape, whether there was something wrong with the inoculation, maybe they didn't get a high enough dose, I don't know. So they, they looked at the half who did get uh, who did get infected, and they got pretty high viral loads, and then they followed them through. Bottom line here was that two of the people who were inoculated and got infected excreted 90%, nearly 90% of the virus. So if you looked at the, the volume of virus that was excreted by all the participants, Ugh. about 90% came from just two people. That's ma that, that really is like a biological super spreader. It, it was huge. Now, if you then, let, let's back off a little bit and then look at, at, at the patterns just in everybody. The pattern was that very few people were uh, spreading the virus until they had their first symptom. So when the, you know, we talked a lot about asymptomatic, asymptomatic spread. spread. In fact, it was only about 7% of people who were emitting the virus prior to their first symptoms of COVID-19. There was no relationship, by the way, in terms of how much you emitted and your symptomatology. So if you were really sick with the virus, you were not pushing out more virus than somebody who only had mild symptoms. In, they looked at rapid antigen tests. And if you're, those of you, those who were turned positive with their rapid antigen test, Basically, only 2% of people were emitting virus before the rapid antigen test became positive, which means that 98% of people, it was pretty much spot on, the rapid antigen test picking up when they were infectious. And the infectious period lasted around about three days at its maximum level. Um, and, and so, the, so a really interesting finding and that the nose was the dominant place that the virus came from. The nose knows. That's so interesting. I have so many questions. Uh, which one should I ask? Well, why not ask me one about Omicron? Because this was the ancestral virus. Okay, then. Oh, oh right. So this was the ancestral virus that they... Um, in, what could it have been like with Omicron? Inoculated them with. No, yeah, no, well, no, what, no, I wanted to put questions in your mouth, you know. What, what could it have been like with Omicron? Well, it could have been more airborne than it was here. So the other thing that I didn't say was that um, in about a quarter, about 25% of, situ of surfaces and hands were infected with the virus. So there was hand spread and surface spread. So they, they, weren't, they, they did not dismiss the, the fact that surface um, cleaning would be important, but the airborne spread did dominate. And it's likely with Omicron that it's more airborne than that virus that they studied then. The thing that this says to me is the fact that 
most people weren't infectious that much before they actually had symptoms just goes to show that when you scale up to millions and millions of people with a virus, that's when you get the, those those few people who are um, infectious before their symptoms come back. Like that's when it, that's when spread becomes really important, and that sort of like individual level, we were all kind of like, oh, am I going to infect my sort of family, that sort of thing. We sort of focus on the micro, but at the macro level, the public health issue is even at a small scale when people are infectious before symptoms or whatever the thing is, it can have really big knock-on effects. It can. There's One of the reasons for publishing this study was that given that vaccines don't control transmission anymore, they did once upon a time, but they've become less effective at that. And given that antivirals don't really affect it terribly much, at least in the initial stages. How you control contagiousness is really important. So from this study, you would suggest in terms of contagiousness, rapid antigen tests aren't that bad at finding out when you start to become infectious, which is what we've been saying in Coronacast for a while, is that symptoms are really important so that the first symptom that you get of an upper respiratory infection, you should be isolating yourself and getting tested so that that, that would control a lot of the spread. And you're right, though, If in a mass sense, if there was a nasty variant around, you would want people, um, once they were, you know, primary contacts to be um, uh, to be isolated. But in this situation that we're in now, you could slow things down a lot by mask wearing after primary contact um, and, um, and isolation once you've actually got your symptoms, if indeed you get them, and rapid antigen testing. So there are, it does allow for some modification, but also uh, not to be blasé about your about hand washing and surface cleaning. Do we know if it, you could extend these results to other viruses? Like, could it be a similar pattern with influenza? So that's a matter of debate, but um, the, the aerosol people who study these things think that, that influenza is probably pretty similar. It's just that COVID-19 is more infectious. So what makes a super spreader? Maybe it's it could be the social side of things, but there's definitely like a biological basis for it as well. That's right. Um, something happens in the nose of super spreaders. Who knows what that is, but it's almost certainly something to do with the immune system. Do we know if once a super spreader, always a super spreader? Like is it something to do with these people or is it something to do with that particular infection? Such a good question, and I haven't got a clue to the answer. Oh. The um, it's, it's a very good question. I mean, it's likely, likely that if, if you're a super spreader first time and then you develop immunity, you may still be a super spreader second time, but you're likely to be spreading it less because the surface immunity in your nose would be stronger to the COVID-19 virus. So, so what, what happens in COVID-19 non-virgins We just don't know at the moment. Our noses are so amazing and powerful. Yeah, who would have thought you've got a virgin nose? You don't know where my nose has been, Norman. It's not one of my evening fantasies. Oh, good Lord. Well, that is all we have time for on Coronacast today. We'll catch you next week. Stay clean. (laughs) Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.